I remember thinking, we need to get these boys out into the farm. You know, we need to have some land to run around, and we need to have a place to ride horses, and we need to have a place to gather firewood and split wood and build up our muscles. And yeah, we need to have some some back to basic skills. And then the idea came, well, maybe we should move. Maybe we should move over to that property and stop calling it property. Maybe eventually we'll call it we'll call it home. So the idea evolved and it grew. And pretty soon I was thinking about a home that would withstand uh, weather that was more severe. I started thinking about a home that had a greenhouse maybe attached right to it or a barn that wasn't too far to walk to. And then began looking in Mother Earth News Magazine and Countryside and, and saw that people were living in these underground dome homes. And I thought, wow. Oh. Ultimately, when I was sitting with a sketch in front of me, my daily thought was, well, grandma or the children or I or anybody who's living here could get up and go get eggs for breakfast and never have to have anything more than their slippers. Hmm. And then scraps could be taken back out to compost near the greenhouse and the greenhouse scraps could go to the chickens and then the chicken manure would come back into the greenhouse and all of a sudden this idea of everything moving and living within this small dome configuration was all a flow. First I found my design and I said okay this is going to take somebody who can really think <laughs> out of the box <laughs> into the dome and uh, you know I had some wonderful local people that were supportive that said you know we'll figure it out we'll work together. He said it's, it sounds like it's very entailed and uh, he's, she's already scared one guy off. <laughs> <laughs> Contractors didn't know how to build a project that wouldn't have a roof a series of domes that would be waterproofed and buried. But the concept intrigued Adam Barrup, a green builder from West Michigan, who was looking for a challenge. Nobody else would do it. I've always been an adventurist anyways, and since here in Michigan there aren't any real mountains to climb, this whole thing was kind of my adventure. I wanted to see where it would go. I knew that I didn't know enough. I knew that I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So um, I started seeking through solar and, and through wind people you know how am I gonna work this out and finally one said you know do you have your contractor do you have your builder and I said I do not and I am looking and so I was given the name you know Adam Barrup and you know Adam was pretty busy when I first contacted him I, I was able to call him he called me right back we had a great conversation one of my first questions is are you a two percenter are you one of the people that thinks completely different than the rest and he laughed and he said he was and I wondered did <laughs> Does he know what I'm even talking about? But it was very clear after our conversation he did. One night when I was trying to get a couple hours of sleep before I ran to the other side of the state real quick, I sat up in bed and, and thought about it. And, uh, you know, it just seems so interesting. You know, if I want a continuous improvement, here's a chance to, to buy, build five different underground domes, which meant it was like building five different houses. We could see how each one of those houses performed. The nerd side of me thought, Wow, ground temperature. You know, this means that you're building a structure where the majority of it is always conditioned by the ground. It should never go below the mid-50 degree range. That's cool, because then that helps us push the envelope farther. That's also what started getting me very excited. Well, it's underground. There's earth covering it. It seemed neat. When she sent me the plans is when I was hooked. The earth shelter stems from a design that has been used since the 1970s, but the integration of barns, greenhouses, and a guest house put it in a category all its own. There wasn't a construction manual for this design, only the generic dome assembly. You know, it's funny how uh, ambition and passion will get people, and it has throughout the generations, into trouble because that's exactly what happened. Looking at the plans, you can see that there, it's a pretty good scale. And you think, well, you know, things go together. You bolt stuff together, you put concrete on it. The plans and the generic owner's manual that they send with it, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Absolutely no idea. The plans don't tell you that you're gonna go out to a field where there's a big pile of steel laying there that isn't labeled correctly. With people standing around that you have to pay that you bid a project on. The plans don't tell you that it's not so good to bury these things in clay, which is what we were standing in and have been into almost up to our knees the entire time on this project. The plans don't tell you about all those types of things or about shot creep. You know, I always joked, and I think this is true, that a set of plans like that should come with a hug. 
The good news is that a similar project was being built on the west coast, and the domes were just getting ready for cement. Here we are in Washington State. We came all this way from Michigan to check out this earth shelter house. Pam's domes don't include a greenhouse or barn, but the struggles she and her contractor have faced are important. The kit will arrive in Michigan soon, and Adam wants all the information he can get on how to put it all together. Especially important is how to drain the water from a building that will be underground. And then when we get ready to backfill, I'll put pea gravel over this and I'm going to put geocloth over the top of this so that I know these things will be able to work. Cement work will be one of the things the crew will have to hire out. Finding a company that can handle the spraying of gunite or shotcrete will not be easy. We come here to learn and we've certainly learned a lot. We hope to use that and incorporate it in our project back in Michigan. So it's all good. Fired up over Pam's progress, the crew returned to Michigan to prepare the site. The layout of the dome structure isn't for the best view. It's facing in a direction to make best use of the sun. Passive solar design. We have to set the house about five degrees to the southeast, so we're going to use the old school transit and shoot in our points so we know that these domes are going to be set up the way we need them. So pardon me while I focus. Passive solar is where you can heat your house with the sun and with proper shading and awnings and whatnot, you can shade the sun during the hotter months. It's a neat way to heat and cool your house for free. But in order to do that in northern Michigan, five degrees to the southeast is about uh, optimal for that to work well. And what that will do is the sunshine will come in almost as soon as it comes above the trees on the horizon, which is about 8.30 in the wintertime, and it'll stay in there all the way until 5 p.m. or so, whatever time of year it is, and it will fill the entire uh, dome with sun. You know, and as you get in towards June, June, middle of June, the sun reaches its highest point in the sky and the domes are actually shaded. Many of the construction duties will be handled by hybrid homes, but subcontractors will be called in for electricity, foam insulation, and much of the cement work. We're not doing stamp concretes and that type of thing. Correct. We're, we're, I mean, we got access to stuff like that, but right now we're right. not. We are looking for uh, the footings and some retaining walls. And some retaining walls at some point, and then the concrete floors. The site was excavated and footings were poured to hold the massive domes. Delays on the delivery of the earth shelter kit pushed the team into late November. It took several pieces of large equipment to set this. It took me crawling to the top of the scaffolding and bolting it together. These pieces come together piece by piece and they're supposed to be labeled. That's one of the things we learned out in Washington is to ask them to label it. You would think that a kit would come out and you know what they tell you on the phone? They say. Uh, haven't you ever put anything together? It should be obvious that the large pieces go into the small pieces. Click. So at that point, we put the generic owner's manual down and settled into what we always do, and that is we just go and get the job done. While Adam was working up high, his father was aligning the steel down low. My job was when we put the framing up was to, to get it from the bottom and turn it so that you could set it in where it had to be bolted. If you look at it like this, here's the thing coming in, it had to line up just right and then you bolt it. And it not always did it, not always line up, you had to muscle it and stuff like that. We're here day two of the Earth Shelter Project for what we're doing, which is building the domes. And yesterday was a tough day, just trying to get started, get some things up. But we got some dome parts up. We're gonna see where we get by the end of today. We were building this steel structure and I was feeling this, uh, you know, this spine and this bones, you know, happening and then we're going to lay the flesh on it. And even when, uh, when Adam was talking about, you know, being underground, you have to be able to have good air exchange. So we started referring to the air as lungs and you really saw this project come alive. So walking into that steel, it was, it was very, um, this is it, we're doing it. And normally when you, when you draw something, you start realizing, oh, we can't afford to do that or that. You're told that won't work. You know, you have a nice dream, but that's not going to work. And so you're going to have to, you know, turn that or scratch that. And that didn't happen here. The whole dream just kept evolving and kept becoming. So nothing was taken away. If anything, things were things were added, and that was that was a beautiful process. Because each dome would eventually be hardened in concrete, a skeletal system of rebar had to be installed. Under the gun to install tens of thousands of rebar ties, the word went out that there was work available. I had not even really known that this project was going on. I had asked a friend of a friend's if he knew about any work when I ran into him in the insurance office one day. and. He had told me that uh, there was a job tying rebar. So I was like, oh, I'll go check it out. 
and headed out to the site, got some directions and headed out to the site here. And last guy of like 15 people to be hired in and almost didn't get in. You know, Crazy Joe arrived in the project, he'd heard about it from someone else and he said, I'm looking for some work. And and I thought, you know, we've got a full crew out here. We certainly don't need anyone else. And so I went and talked to Adam and he said, you know, just, just give the guy a shovel because you can only tell someone's character by if they're willing to shovel all day. And Joe shoveled all day and he smiled and he kept shoveling. He shoveled not only the snow off that footing but brushed the snow off all our cars and went through everywhere and just was really working hard to get a spot. Next thing I know he's up on the domes with the other guys working probably twice as fast as what they were doing and I asked who is this guy? He said his name is Joe. I'm like I like him. I want him working by me. I mean no you're not just gonna walk in and ever get the CEO position. You know, <laughs> it starts at the ground, you know. Joe soon found out that even Uncle Roger didn't escape the mundane chores on the job site. Adam is the leader. He's, he's the brain, mainstay of this whole thing, and people have to respect it, me included. I get no special favors because I'm his father. Absolutely not, and I would not want any special favors, you know. What I get, Joe, uh, Crazy Joe gets, or my other son Jason, the Rev gets. Crazy Joe had worked on countless building projects, but had never seen a construction site like this before. And I looked at it, and when I first saw it, it looked like something off the Star Wars movie. You know how you see all the burlap and the domed edges and everything, and I was like, crazy. <laughs> this is the place for me. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, baby, well, yeah. snow missed us. Just a dusting here. Back where I'm from, back on the lakeshore of Michigan west coast as we call it we got about 10 inches of snow so other than the drive in today we're good to go the sun's going to come out and melt some stuff and we're going to ramp some rebar basically you have to put it either vertically or horizontally I, th I forget how many inches is apart but you have to tie that thing piece by piece by piece i think adam mentioned around 80,000 ties I figured it out to be well over 100,000 ties that we all did. Well, it was repetitious, but you just go and you start whistling and you're doing your thing and you do the best you can to have a good attitude because, again, it's the job that has to be done. These are called linesman's pliers or rebar pliers. You'll see how they work in just a minute. These are called blisters from using them, so be careful, wear gloves. Pieces of burlap are tied into the structure to provide a backing for the cement. Well, good morning to you. We had a blizzard up here, and today we're supposed to get 50 mile an hour winds. And uh, so far, nobody's really enjoying the idea of working today. Hoping we got a couple, otherwise it's yours truly all by himself for a while until everybody can get unthawed. That's not any different than how the business usually is this time of year. So I'm going to go on sheer excitement alone today. I'll do it all myself. I've done it before. Her shelter. You know, a lot of work, but I can't wait for it to be done because it's going to be so exciting to the world. Let's see who shows up and see what kind of day we can have with 50 mile an hour winds. The biggest problem was that the snow would prevent people from getting to work. A lot of guys got rides from other people and if, you know some of them had kids and they'd have the day off so we did have a couple of pretty bad blizzards along there where we found ourselves just a couple of us out there. Sometimes it was just me. It was a Friday and you know the show must go on so we just keep pushing forward. I feel like I'm filming an episode of Survivor Man instead of Earth Shelter Man. But I'm going to show you how to unroll this burlap that goes around the domes and how to do it by yourself in a blizzard. So check it out. Only weeks into the project, the brutal winter was already taking a toll on the crew. Yeah. Bad lip. Well, we worked in a blizzard today. About negative five wind chill is what they said. 
I think it's Thursday, first uh, week or so of December. And uh, gave it everything we got all day. Freezing cold, and then here right at the last second, I lost grip of the pliers because it's just too cold to hang on anything. Got myself right in the, the lip. Stop bleeding because it's cold out. It just froze or something. So later tonight, it's going to be tough. 1,000 rebar ties per box. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 more that went. So that's 19,000 ties that we put into this so far. Getting real good at tying. All right, as you can see, you got a lot of rebar here. That gunny sack material is behind there. It's kind of weird you can see through them all. We got a ways to go, but we've done a good job. This kind of gives you an idea of the scope of this project. It's big. These, these are rebars, obviously. This is a mesh, and it's got to be tight here so that the shot creep when you pour on it doesn't cave it in. So Looks it's like a, you uh, got your work cut out for you. Yeah, but it's uh, it's something that it's a labor of love, I guess, because when this thing is all said and done, it's going to be. You can say that we really put a lot of work into it, a lot of into, uh, thinking about what we're supposed to do, and then just doing it. So and it's, when you look around and see all this stuff, it just still amazes me. As much as I've been turning ties and stuff, it still amazes me the way it looks when it's finished part. So we'll right. continue on. We'll let you get back at it. All right, thank you. Well, it's Tuesday, and uh, it's going good. We have quite a few people here, and it's tough because trying to stay out ahead of all the people that are at rebar and things on a project that you've never done before, you have to be a quick thinker so nobody stands around. But it's going good. They said there's a winter storm warning. We could get up to a foot of snow. We'll check back in the morning and see how much snow we get. I'm hoping that they're wrong. Snow or no snow, we're going to keep going. You can bet that. Let's get back to work. Hey, gentlemen. Yeah. Understand we're almost done tying rebar. How does that feel? Great. Wait, it's finally both done. Do you tie rebar in your sleep? Yeah. I even have dreams about it. I tie rebar see on a date. <laughs> Is it hot chocolate time? I think it's hot chocolate time. I better go get some of that. We need the hot chocolate. It's a cold day out here. Cold. The designer of the Earth Shelter toured the project as the final rebar was strung up. Okay, let's talk about some bracing. Okay. We'll go back down in that dome okay. so we can open up the prints to look at the floor system. Some of the biggest questions came down to sealants. How do you protect an underground home from nearly constant water seepage? When the ICFs are up, we want to make the ICFs and the domes all one for waterproofing. We don't want any joints that are under here. So when they spray the, the uh, waterproofing and everything, it's just one unit. One big masonry unit all over the place. Right. Become water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Figure how you're going to get in there. I mean, right. And anywhere, you know, there's a, a joint, because that's the obvious place. The water is a real pain in the butt. It's, it's a very good solvent. <laughs> it's fine. And what you have to remember on an earth st structure, earth sheltered structure, the water's under pressure. So you get out here and wet it with a hose all day long, won't do anything. You put 10 feet of dirt on it, that's going to drive it right in. Drive it through it, the smallest pinhole you can find. Uh, the Michigan project's pretty neat, uh, mainly because it's just a big project. It's a really well thought out, neat ladies building the project. Uh, and she's got some really good ideas. She's growing things in it. She's uh, going to live in it. Uh, I think it's part of her business. Uh, we haven't done a lot of structures that big. I think the biggest project we did was a, uh, a big project up in Montana, but this was one of the biggest projects we've done. And it looks pretty nice from the outside. You know, it's a very practical approach to uh, doing something with our shelter that makes some sense. The site visit was also Adam's chance to give some feedback to the designers on their vague instruction manual. We had told them what we thought about their system and how it had went, and the guy said, what are you complaining about? You'd put it up in 52 hours, the quickest it has ever been put up, all five domes. So I guess we did an incredible thing. Oh, the weather 
outside really sucks. It's Michigan in December. I don't know the rest of the words of the song. The holidays came on with the reality that the crew was running out of time to pour the face of the earth shelter. The insulated concrete forms that house the windows and make up the only exposed area of the home. And if everyone was going to make it home for Christmas, the team was going to have to get started early, real early. It's about 2 a.m. We're out here trying to finish our wall up so we can pour today. Adam said we had to get it done tonight. It's not fun. Those aren't Christmas lights. Those are truck lights of our crews getting here while it's still dark to get ready to pour insulated concrete forms. It's beginning to look a lot like ICF Day. We got to look in our eye. It's Christmas Eve. We're looking forward to going home, but we got to get the job done before we can go anywhere. So we got up early. We got to get some lights going, and we're going to make this thing happen. And we're going to get back before this big storm comes through. We're supposed to get a bunch of freezing rain, some snow on top of that, and uh, Rebar with freezing rain on it. It's going to make it impossible to work, especially if we hit a deep freeze after that. So part of today, insulated concrete forms are going to be poured. We've got to get all the domes covered up up high with tarps. It's bound to be an interesting day and still be able to get out of here before the storm prevents all of us that live out of town from getting home to our Christmas Eve and dinners and whatnot. So let's check it out see what kind of day we can have. It's bound to be a hoot. Do what you got to do to get the job done because we are the ones. What do you think about uh, Christmas Eve? We're looking forward to getting home. Looking forward to getting home, but then I'm also going to have satisfaction that we're doing a great job here. Everybody's gelling together, getting things done, and we're proud of it. So let's just keep on working and get her done. Yes. We all want to get home for Christmas. We want to beat the snowstorm, so do what it takes. We're we'll work. working late. Working all night long. <laughs> Well, we made it through week four, and it was supposed to be a short week, four days, well, three and a half days. We worked all through the night. We did everything we could possibly do to make sure that when we went home for Christmas Eve, that we had all the ICS poured that we could pour and cover up for this gigantic ice storm that's coming through. So we'll have to see what works out with that. Merry for now, see you Monday. Merry Christmas, Joe. See, everybody's in a festive mood. So we got covered up what we can with tarps. They're forcing me to take a couple days off, so we're going to have to catch you on Monday. For now, it's week four on the Earth Shelter Project. I'm Adam. Thanks for coming along. When the crew returned to the domes, it was obvious that they weren't going to see that January warm-up necessary to spray concrete. We hit a point, it was getting too cold. It, winter was closing in quickly, and we weren't ready to put that shot crate on, but if we didn't put it on, then we would have to wait until all the way across to the spring, to the spring thaw, and that wasn't going to be wise. Um, so we made the best decision for the project, and we waited, and we came inside, and we started building, you know, the second floor of the house, and we started creating structure. Even before the dome, which was going to be unmovable, was put in place, so, you know, we were taking a risk, but we talked about it, we always talk about all these big decisions, and we, we felt it was right. So we built inside and then put it up in the spring. Even my square is green. It's always tough building things here in Michigan in the winter time. Uh, you're guaranteed snow in northern Michigan, but you never know exactly how much you're going to get. Sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's cold. We're coming in about the middle of January now, and the uh, snow is closing in on us. Not too bad. We keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and now there's a little more snow removal involved. This is the first wall going up. First wall up. Bring in the furniture. Ready to move in. Bring in the furniture. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very exciting to see the first wall go up. Everything seems <laughs> very real now. 
Domed burlap walls were now being framed in as living spaces, bathrooms, and bedrooms. The homeowner's sketches were becoming a home. Now we're in the main house. The walls are really amazing because they give you a sense of where everything belongs, maybe even where you're going to set up your bed, your couches. We're looking through the long living room into the kitchen and on into the dining area. The shape of the room soon became a spider web of bracing, the framework designed to protect the men as they sprayed concrete from above. We were bracing and then bracing some more. You wouldn't even recognize, you know, uh, the house because there was bracing structures everywhere. It was like walking through a maze. Uh, there were times when Crazy Joe was running around on the bracings and the rafters, but the whole place was braced from the inside in every direction so that that heavy weight of the cement until it hardened wouldn't fall through and crush our, crush our cave. <laughs> The bracing that we did was a little bit more entailed than what was in the generic owner's manual, but we had figured since everything else we had to figure out and all this wood was just kind of given to us and was just secondary wood, that we would brace upon brace upon brace, again because we, nobody could tell us. To walk on top of the dome with four people in a hose that weighed 40 pounds per foot with concrete, which is probably one of the most dangerous substances known to man, and anybody that works in that industry probably would agree, it's so unstable and you never know what it's going to do, that I wanted it braced. If I was going to be up there or the guys were going to be up there, it had to be safe. Tubes were installed to provide channels for a special lighting system. Each had to be reinforced with rebar so the cement would protect the delicate reflectors underground. In order to light the areas of the domes where the windows didn't have an effect on, we used something which is called a sun tunnel, which is put up in the, the roof, if that's what it's called, of the earth shelter and lets in light. Now these sun tunnels have a mirrored finish on the inside, which are about three to four feet long, depending on which dome they're in, and they let in an incredible amount of light so that when you're in there in the barn or the greenhouse or any one of the domes, it looks like daylight, even though in some areas you're over 30 feet underground. Imagine that this floor were the dome. So the tubes stick up four feet with the dirt coming to here. If you were to look into here, you would see inside the house when it was done. And since there's no plans in the manual on how to do this, just basically another good luck, I'm sure you'll do fine. We did fine. We uh, wrapped some rebar, three different spots, some chicken wire, and then we bent some rebar, just like this. In a few weeks, you'll see what idea we had for a cap on top of this. So it looks fairly simple, but it took a little bit of thought, and now we're uh, just going through and making 31 of them. How the heck are you gonna make a straight piece of rebar round so that it fits around your tubes. And I said, I'll show you. All right, resources. What do we have out here? Well, we've got a lot of steel, we got a lot of wood and a lot of rebar to bend. We walk by in the little holes that are in here which are basically in the ribs just for setting the steel and work as a great rebar turner and I'll show you how it works. You gotta go at it, make sure you don't stab anybody with it. Slow. But sure. The cool thing is that I'm not using very much pressure at all. But I am left handed, and you know what they say about left handed people it could be just that that I'm left handed. That's how you do it, to go from straight to round. The barn will receive the most light tubes. When you bring animals into a dark barn that's underground, one of the things that happens that Temple Grandin has done an incredible amount of research on with cows is that their eyes change like what ours do. So when you walk out of the sun and you walk underground, they'll rear up because it's like they're walking into a wall. So with these sun tunnels, in there, 12 of them actually in the barn, it looks like daylight. So there's very little change between the outside and when the animals walk into the barn, therefore taking away the, the danger part of bringing them into their corrals. Why do you think the Scottish Highlander will be a good cow for the ranch? Uh, a couple good reasons. Uh, they can eat brush, they can eat uh, wild grass, it doesn't have to be pasture grass, and they require very, very little water. And uh, although they'll have plenty, 
They're just hardier. They can stay outside all winter long. They do not require shelter, and they take care of each other pretty well. They have great herd mentality. They look like Ewoks from Star Wars. I, you know, they're just they're wonderful. Um, all of the, the the calves that that you see in um, in this documentary were you know were born here on the farm, and that's just magical for us. And they were born one Saturday after another, three Saturdays in a row. And when you have a healthy herd like that, they just they don't require the the extra care. We haven't had any veterinarian bills since we've been here because we're raising them on, on such nutritious grasses, multiple grasses. That's a twelve. 12 grass mix that's so got red clover in it, which is nutritious, and it's got old alfalfa and a couple different types of, it's got timothy. So we don't believe in the mono destroying alfalfa. you got to have a mixture, just like you wouldn't want to eat the same thing every day. You'd, you'd want to have a mix. <laughs> Construction materials in the barn reflect this same ideal, using recycled barn timbers where the animals will live. These big pieces of timber are white oak. And we're going to use them to support the floor load above the stalls. The homeowner made a very good point about putting treated lumber into stalls where the animals could chew on it. So we went with white oak, which is really tough, really durable, under any condition, wood. So that's what you see us doing here. And we're going to use four of them to hold up that section. I think we're going to need another person on this. The crew's well-being was also on the homeowner's mind, which led to some controversial meals. What do you got today, Mom, that you're serving? Carrot dogs. Carrot dogs. <laughs> Last week, hot dogs, healthy. This week, even healthier. Yeah, we got an email that said, uh, should you be eating hot dogs? Well, those were the healthy ones, I'm told. These ones were assured to have nothing but carrot in them. So, carrot dog. John, how do you like carrot dogs? It's like a carrot on a butt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's no, good. no, no. It tastes like that. You had the mustard to it, boy. You, know, you, you have to grow up with a little imagination anymore. around here. <laughs> I have to tell you, these guys are troopers because on a few occasions, uh, we might have gone the, the extra long distance to inspire their health. But yeah, we, we steamed uh, ferret dogs and marinated them in butter and, uh, and honey. And that makes them absolutely delicious. And we served them to them in buns. And, you know, we got some looks from the guys, but they were, they were commenting on how surprisingly tasty things were. So, yeah, they've had carrot dogs and a few other great recipes. I'm sorry, folks, but carrot hot dogs is not for me because it's a bun with a carrot in it. I thought she meant there was carrots ground up into a hot dog. I was all for it. But when I, I went out there and I'm, all, I'm hungry and I'm excited to have it, What's this carrot hot dog? And it's a carrot in a bun. Nah, you know. So I kind of thought it was funny, and you know, no thanks, not interested. Good morning. It's April 26th, first day of a spray pour, and it is 6:30 in the morning. The team is ready, and I think I've just seen the first cement truck arriving. There's a couple things about shot creep. Number one. This is stuff, or gunite, it's called in different areas of the country, that's made to be able to spray out of a hose. Now this stuff is also sets up really, really, really strong. It sets up like rock, like granite, but it sets up very quickly. They're telling us that they had, from the time they mixed it at the factory, somewhere around an hour to an hour and a half before it really started setting up. So we needed to find a concrete company, one, that would actually make this mix, that would trust us that we'd use it up before it hardened in their truck, which then becomes very expensive for everybody. This is the ooze before the, <laughs> before the cement. What we got here, Brandon, this is the lube? Yeah, it's a primer. The primer that went in the hose to make sure everything's going to slide on through. Brandon's the man in charge of all that. Big yeah, gooey. The trucks are coming down the driveway, and remember, we have a certain amount of time, you know, less than two hours from the time it leaves. 45 minutes away to get there and spray it and here is the inspector saying I don't know Adam I don't see an inch of space they have to have twice the diameter of the rebar in concrete around every piece of rebar and the first layer of rebar is just designed to step on thankfully the owner of the air shelter company picked his phone up that day and I handed it to the to the inspector Meanwhile, when Crazy Joe came up and asked me what we should do, I said, load the machine up, we're going to go. 
Like, what about the inspector? I'm like, number one rule, don't freak out. Load it up, let's go. And thankfully, Gene picked up the phone in Colorado, and the rest is history. Well, it's pretty clear here early on that this is no easy job. These guys are fighting this hose. They're getting the hang of it, but it looks heavy, and it looks intense. They're doing an amazing job. You can see the cement starting to accumulate. You have to spray it a certain way out of the hose and stack it up. You go across the dome and back and it sets up so quickly that you they call it lifts. You spray it in lifts. So as high as what you are, I'm six foot something, you spray it as high as you can reach, then you go up in the air and come back across it. And that amount of time, it's hard enough for you to be able to spray the next lift. Wow, it's really starting to look amazing. We've got, uh between the other side, the side that you can see here, about eight yards on. And uh, we did five yards in the first truck just so we know how it would go, half a truck. This, this truck's got five yards, and the next one coming will have seven, see how it handles the road. If that works well, the next truck will have nine yards. It would be great if the hose were constant pressure, like a garden hose, but it's not. Imagine if the garden hose let out spurts every few seconds. So. To spray it, you plant your feet and you spray for about five seconds and that lets off and you go back. And then you lean back into it and it's like that for the entire process. Even when you go up in the air, which is pretty interesting. The team pumping the concrete told Adam that spraying the nozzle would be like trying to wrestle an anaconda. They didn't tell me it was an anaconda with rabies and on steroids, but <laughs> that's going to be a good workout. Well, the ground is good. We'll see how it goes once we get up in the air. A few prayers might be in order. I think they've been underway. Good. We need them. Uncle Raj, what happened to you? I'm in there protecting them so that when there's holes that it, the uh, concrete don't go through it. So You're on the underside. I'm on the underside getting the shower or cement, which is okay. If you don't get dirty, you're not doing your job. <laughs> awesome. So that was something we learned out in Washington State. Uh, as you spray, the holes will rip in the burlap because sun uh, UV rays break down the burlap. And if you let it lay around for a while or if it's on a dome for a while at a place as large as this one, you have some you know, decomposing of that stuff. So Uncle Raj had a bunch of cardboard that he would slide through. We started with radios, but you couldn't hear anything out there. It was so incredible. The, the noise was so loud. Couldn't communicate with people except yelling at Joe which way to go, and he would tap me on the shoulder if somebody was waving their hand. So we had no idea what to do except that out in Washington they said, you know, cardboard would help out and to cover up the concrete because it gets everywhere. Welcome to day three of the spray. Things are going amazingly well. The guys are working really hard and they figured out every little niche to do in this as fast as possible and this morning they sprayed what appears to be seven yards in 46 minutes that's absolutely amazing we're actually waiting on the second truck to arrive you'll notice there's connector domes little ones those aren't structural like the main dome so we'd stop there and make sure that we knew exactly how much concrete would be on each dome and that's how much we'd ordered each day Finally, though, I had talked them right towards the end into sending out a full truck. It's going great. We haven't had any problems other than a few minor malfunctions. Send it out. Day four, we had our first breakdown. We got a truck full of concrete. Day four blues continue. Just blew a hydraulic line on our pump. So everybody's going crazy. We got nine yards of concrete on the way that we might have to dump on the ground. This is not good. You're timing the trucks, and so I'm on the, on the watch, literally writing down how long it's taking to apply a load, and then you have the next truck coming in, but we're spraying such thick cement that it can harden, so the truck cannot be sitting on site for too long. And then one day, uh, you know, a part uh, went on the spraying equipment, and we had a whole truck full of cement waiting. The rig broke down right after I convinced the concrete company to send us a full truck. As a f almost full truck was pulling up to the hopper, it broke. I knew that there was no concrete coming out of the hose, so I set it down and I could see people running around with their hands in the air because you can't hear anything out there. There's so many diesel pieces of equipment running, you can't hear anything. We got some left on the truck. We're going to pull it in, dump it on the ground, bring it up by buckets to do the light tubes. Uh, day four blues. 
Yep, that's concrete. What we did, we had a lot of scraps around because this project seems to be everything about reuse and recycle. So somebody had donated some used plywood and whatnot. So we had put all this plywood on the ground and then had them dump the concrete on the plywood. Number one rule, don't freak out. There is always a way to take care of any issue. The team, uh, Elmer's uh, Concrete, took our man to a parts place, got him what he needed, rushed him back. While they were fixing it, the guys were taking by the bucket full up the steps and putting cement around the light tubes or anything they could use that extra cement for because we didn't want it to harden. We had enough people there, a support crew, that they would put it into buckets and those of us that were up on the domes were troweling it on by hand. That was more tough than carrying the hose around for five days and spraying all that concrete myself. The hardest part of it. And just then, I look out and this guy who's about as wild as Crazy Joe, Cousin Kevin shows up and he's a mason. He shows up and kind of pushes me aside because he can see I'm struggling and starts troweling on all this mud that's set up. I go down and start shoveling the, the concrete and here comes the other truck that they had ordered. And it's sitting out there winding up and said as soon as you hear the motor start going under stress, put that stuff in it that slows it down as you said and we'll see what we can do. And the phone rings and it's the concrete company telling me I told you so. Just then their mechanic pulls in with the pump operator. They put on this broken hydraulic line. I had motion for the truck to pull up. I hop back up on top of the dome, turn the machine on and finish spraying it right into the sunset. The shot treating was probably the most trying. I mean it was uh, being up on that boom with that hose that weighs 40 pounds a foot and uh, you know, the ground, as you see out here, isn't exactly level and never really was, and it's a lot better now than it was back in the day. You know, big trenches right next to the domes, and you had to drive that boom lift that was a little rickety, and you know what I mean? You got the directional controls, but you know, you go the way you're supposed to, and it kind of swings this way first and then that way, and you know, and Adam thought I was going the wrong way, and he's getting a little upset here and there. But, you know, I mean, I would be too if I was him, especially, you know, swinging that hose and everything. It's the end of day five. Um, we got done a little bit early. I thought for sure we would be working on Saturday. That was not the case. As you can tell, we're all pretty uh, tired out, dirty, and wore out. But we did it. World's largest earth shelter project. Largest one ever attempted is now officially shot created. We were told by the man who brought the equipment that a half an hour on that hose is all that one man will be able to stand. And I said, well, you haven't seen this crew. And he looked at Adam and he said, well, maybe 45 minutes for, for the big guy. Um, but Adam didn't let go of that hose. He, he kept it the whole first day. And he said, I don't want to trade it out because now I've just got a feel for how to spray it. So I want to keep going. He didn't want to lose that momentum. Truck after truck is coming. Uh, by Wednesday, he hadn't let go of it. We were up and down with this. Uh, we had some wonderful rental equipment that took us up and down the dome. And on the last day, I think he realized, you know, he needed to share some of that excitement. And so everyone got a chance to spray temporarily. But um, finally, Bob, who was, you know, in charge of the sprayer, was just shaking. And he said, he said, I've never seen anything like it. But it was that determination. And he has this, you know, determination to, to truly make a difference in the planet. To, to save the planet. He has that wonderful saying, if, you know, at the end, everyone just shuts the light off before they leave the room that he's done his purpose and you know you could see that you could see that in that strength of spraying this entire place for five days straight. I have to applaud him because the fact is that I, I've seen other people that didn't quite think they want to do it. This man he, he stepped up and he took that thing it took a lot of, and it takes a lot of work. I don't have to tell you that I can tell you exactly what it went to but me seeing him struggle with that me seeing him with the patience a little bit of irritability from time to time, but he also, I believe, knew this job had been done. And again, rather than trying to explain it to somebody else how he wants it done, there's the old saying, if sometimes if you want something done right, you do it yourself. And I'm telling you, I admire him because he did the whole thing. The owner who came out there, Gene, the one that uh, manufactured that, he said, I can't believe this man did this whole thing himself. That makes me proud, but it also, makes people understand what he, how he is committed to, to doing this project and I just applaud him so I can do it. So we have this amazing, you know, four to six inches of cement and then on top of that we're going to put some, some insulation for warmth. 
All right. So we have uh, two inches in some spaces over the barn, not as much, about an inch. And then there's this liquid rubber, and it is sticky, gooey, gooey mess, okay? And this gets rolled on. You can't spray it on. It's too thick to spray. So the crew rolled this on. And then uh, we're looking at covering it up with the dirt now and saying to ourselves, what happens if there's a rock? And the rock punctures that. And does that compromise? And our, we're never going to want to have to undig this place. So we don't want to come back and, and ever have to undig a dome. So we thought we'd lay uh, plastic. And that seemed like a pretty good idea. But then we got the idea that, that maybe carpet. Carpet would cover rocks from coming through. We became dumpster divers. So for about two months, we went and got every piece of carpet. A uh, local restaurant, I recognized their carpet. That's over the main house dome. <laughs> I would say a scary part of that would be when you scratch your leg on a nail in a dumpster full of garbage and, uh, you know, cat used carpet. Thankfully, our uh, homeowner is a naturopath and had some remedies for that because I was pretty scared. Just as scary was the bid for drywalling the curved surfaces of the dome. Uh, drywall's drywall, you know, I mean, it's not really ever easy, but it's not all that tough. And I mean, I had heard that they couldn't find anybody that was willing to hang it. And I told them, well, why don't we hang it? I mean, it's just, you know, a little more round than, you know, but you got to think outside the box. I mean, it's, I guess that's what separates the men from the boys. You might think that it's a little premature for the wood stoves, but actually we need them to warm up the domes to be able to start finishing the drywall. Because being off the grid, we're not going to hook up the generators and things for a while, so no electric heat, no gas heat, we're going to do it with wood, so that's what we're going to do. And we're also going to burn some of our scrap from this project, so you know, it's all good. So we've come up with an idea that we want to, to drywall this entire guest dome, the smaller dome that's in here. And when you decide what to get, you got to think of it a couple different ways. One, you got to think about how much time it's going to take versus what it would have cost and the time it would have took doing it another way. So figuring out a material list for that can be tough, and that's what we're doing right now, just trying to make sure we have enough stuff show up. We can always send it back if we keep it covered up. So I think I'm going to err on the side of having some left over that we can send back. The finished surface was smoothed out by a pro, which left the perfect medium for a local artist. This is a, a, a World of Warcraft inspired mural, so we're doing the backgrounds right now, turning the closets into uh, a castle, and there's going to be all kinds of characters and all that stuff. So. I took inspiration from one of my favorite books, The Ranger's Apprentice, and I said, let's make it this scene from this chapter in the book, and added in characters from trading card games and what have you. Oh, it was perfect. Bulldozers began the long process of covering the domes with soil. I think the, the part that was, was interesting is, okay, the cement is up, but now we're going to start to cover it. So we're really going to test, you know, is this the sturdy home that you want to live underground in? And uh, I have to tell you, I was definitely here the day that that bulldozer took the top. And uh, <laughs> we came inside to see how brave we were. And you could hear it, and it shook a little bit, but the, the structure itself did not shake. And when you have a bulldozer up top and you've got four feet of dirt and you're standing below, you know you're safe forever. <laughs> like, you're feeling very confident about your home. <laughs> I love it here. I love it. This is very safe. I think the last scoop of dirt just felt like, okay, now it's time to move in. And it's not about coming here every day and checking on the project. It's, it's not about that anymore. It's about living the project. So. The final scoop of dirt, the, the final, hey, it's time for you to move in, uh, was a, a, a major lifestyle change. We've, we've been preparing ourselves to living off the grid. grid. We've been preparing by having no dishwasher and practicing. But it, it was time to move in and become what we'd been dreaming about, not just talking about it anymore. Now buried underground, the earth shelter is far from a cave. There is more light in this earth shelter home than there was in our previous standard home. And part of the reason is we've got that wonderful uh, tilt to the southeast, and we have windows across the whole front. I tell people we live underground, they think we live where we come into a hole, and we don't. Uh, the whole front is a, like a walkout basement, and there's windows everywhere. But when we made use of those light tubes, 
So even at night, the moonshine or the starlight, everything lights us up. I, I never feel like we're underground. I'm, right now, we are technically sitting 28 feet underground, and I don't know if you're, as you're looking here, if you feel like I'm, I'm underground, but I don't feel it at all. Whenever we look at thermal images on our other houses, you can see that the weakest link in all of our structures were the windows. They leak air in and out. They, it's just a pane of glass or two between the inside and the outside, and that can cause quite a bit of trouble. So when we started looking at the windows on this project, I had to go with the product that we use on all of our other jobs because I knew how they performed. Window consultants normally would recommend low E glass, which blocks up to 17% of the sun's ultraviolet rays from entering the house. I was saying, oh, no, 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 no. In a greenhouse and even in my home, and I know I'm thinking different than the standard, but you already know that about me, is I wanted every aspect of that sun because every aspect of the sun activates a different trace mineral in you or in your plants. And so I said to them, I don't want that protection. I want clear glass windows. And they had to stop the line and make this happen for me, and they were willing to do it. They were, were willing to understand and listen to what I was saying, and they knew that this was a very important project. What's unique about Anderson is that they map out this tree to get the most wood of it as possible, and then take the scrap pieces and make their own lengths of lumber that then go back into making the window. That is a strong story. You know, that way we know that they're using the majority of the wood that they cut down in their product so that we can have their window be in our project. That's a strong story. The other part of it is that they take their sawdust and they fuel a steam generation plant which they then pump back into their manufacturing facility to power their equipment and to heat the place. Now that's a strong story in sustainability. It wasn't surprising that the local media took an interest in the underground home. Television cameras visited during construction and Adam soon found himself in the forefront of green building. Includes a barn, a greenhouse, a house, a storage, and a guest house, all underground. Yes, there's uh, five domes that are underground. For me, media coverage and awards and things like that uh, are beneficial in this way. One, it has other people out there see what we're doing. Now, the message I feel is that this is a place for people to live life on their own terms, a below-ground farm. Those terms have limitations when it comes to electricity. We've always been very careful about um, you know stuff that we do we don't leave the water running we don't leave the lights on when we're not home it just doesn't make sense so not a tr huge shock moving over here but definitely had to be more conscious about the lights and, and uh, using everything we're on it's like uh, electricity rations <laughs> you're aware of how much energy it takes to plug in a curling iron. You become aware because you bought a meter to find out how much energy that freezer is drying. We're not going to turn that generator on unless we absolutely have to. So all chores will converge onto that key hour where we shower and cook and run the dryer and have everything lined up and then unplug it and completely live on the sun. She always seems to be able to do it when I'm in the middle of a shower so that the lights go dark and then you just wait and then the lights come back on and then there's about two minutes of ice cold water from when the heater didn't work. <laughs> Warming from the sun in a tiny wood stove, it's rare that the family wakes up cold. What's great about an earth shelter, and it's pretty amazing because this one is just, they've you know, just done such a beautiful job building it, is we're technically 54 degrees to 58 degrees year round no matter what. So if you don't build the fire that night, you're not gonna freeze. Your pipes aren't gonna freeze, you're gonna be okay. So you could have a great fire, lock it down, let it run on, on embers while you're at work, and come home, and if it's plenty warm, you don't have to build that fire. So we can technically go a couple days here without a fire. There's not many places that can do that. Now, it's going to be running in the low 60s. A few logs on, a couple hours later, we can be just roasting where we want to open the windows. So it's, a, it's learning to live here, it's fun. <laughs> People are asking, when are you, when are you going to be done? When are you going to be done? And we've done everything out here uniquely. So we didn't just buy boards and put down a wood floor. We planned the boards. Okay, so that takes time. You know, cupboards made from 1913 scrap cupboards from all over. You don't just install them. You cut them and you reshore them up and then you paint them and you, you know. So there's a lot of steps because we use so much recycled material out here. You know, that's why I love to build the kitchens or to do the trim or to reuse things that are really old because they're so unique. The wood doesn't grow like it used to. It doesn't smell the same when you cut it now. It's got a unique smell, the old growth stuff. And to think that some of the trees that were used on that were over 300 years old before they were cut, that's cool. 
everything that you see in this place comes from a thought or a passion about, again, about community, about recycling, about doing something nicer for the planet. Uh, that's where all that inspiration comes from. So yeah, I like, I like my barn doors for, for regular doors. Oh my gosh, thank you for getting the truck so quick. We're on the way to uh, a great find from Howard once again. There's an entire hog barn that's being knocked down and the excavators are going to be there in 45 minutes and a 15 minute drive away. So we are going to see if we can knock down this building or get what we can in 30 minutes. The pig barn will become baseboard trim uh, throughout the greenhouse and uh, my parents don't, but don't tell them that they're getting the, the pig barn that's kind of not known yet. Um, it'll be used for, uh, they had a lot of wonderful uh, wood flaps and doors and steel bars that would secure the hogs in this barn. So uh, we have them um, airing out and conditioning outside and, and they didn't smell bad at all. Even with so many donated and discounted materials, this project has an incredible price tag. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, if I would have known the financial commitment to this project early on, I would have been scared off of it. But because we took our time, we were able to make money as the project was going. There are so many things in this earth shelter, um, the majority of which are not new. Uh, we found bricks and on Craigslist for $50. You know, we were able to barter other people for their services. You know, we would work for them, they would work for us. So um, financially it is a, a big commitment, but look at how it will be paying off. This house will be here for hundreds of years in our family. It's not going to break down. So this is a commitment to, uh, to the community. This will serve as more than a home. It'll serve as a classroom. It'll serve as a, uh, a destination. It'll serve as a training spot for other families to get started in farming. And so some of those things will help us financially to come back around full circle where this place completely has paid for itself. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to happen. My name is Adam, and I'm the Earth Sheriff. Adam is also playing the role of teacher, bringing his message of conservation to a new generation. You know what? This is awesome. You guys are going to make great Earth deputies. Few believe they will ever find another project like Earth Shelter. It will likely break records for efficiency, and only new technology will bring improvements to their environmental footprint. To me, I mean, I consider this place to be pretty epic, you know, I mean, I consider it like one of the national monuments or like the pyramids, and only, the only difference between this and the pyramids is a lot more detail in this, you know. But yeah, I, I truly believe this to be one of the most epic creations that I've seen or heard about in my lifetime. I'm very excited to, to see the day that the greenhouse is fully planted, that the gardens are in place, you know, that there's people, that there's this community that she talks about living there and living off the, everything that that land is about. I'm really excited to see that and that time's coming quick. The hybrid home team knows that few of us can afford to live such a dream. And while the majority of us will continue to see utility bills, there are ways for us to improve our consumption as well. You don't have to live off the grid to have a profound impact on your life or on the environment. Just realize what you're using in your house on the grid. Make a budget for electricity, for gas, what you have. Know what you're going to have uh, as far as your heating temperature inside the house. You can do that now in most every state by looking at your bills, your gas bill, or your electric bill, and see which ones are the highest usage. Say right on there or online, and then just look at ways to cut that. That's a great way to have a, a great impact on what's going on right now in the world. I would like you to meet Rudolph. Rudolph is a like size of my head, and we're going to do a demonstration with a nail gun. Just in case somebody thought what it's like to shoot themselves in the head, we're going to show you from a couple of different differences. And maybe we can help them out with that comb over. How's it going? Cookie! <laughs> Joe is the cookie monster. Taco! We're going to test it, moisture tester. They're both testers, we have called it around here. And it's about 40% moisture. We want to try to get that down to 10% or less. Oh, yeah. And so that's straight up energy lows? That's energy lows burning right there, brother. Wow, that's incredible. All right. And here's a demonstration if you fell out the window. What are you doing, Crazy Joe? Fish. What 
the heck have you two been up to? Uh, we've been out uh, trolling the perimeter. I don't know, man. You know, we've been tanning Barney Heights for a lot of years, and um, this is by far the finest festival we've ever had. <laughs> that Barney must have been big. This would be off of the middle of it, his back. You know, he loved this, he loved that. First. These are my last words to my wife <laughs> before I fall off this ladder. Oh, I love you. On. Oh, you've got Uncle Raj and the Howard City Madman. Man. Good start to your collection. Uh-oh. What have we here? Thank you. <laughs> I do my best work here. <laughs>